into the cloud. Okay, well, hello, everybody. Um, <laughs> I should say welcome uh, to the Citizens for Global Solutions Virtual Book Club. Um, today is September 10th, 2022, and I'm Bob Flax, the Executive Director. I'm joined by Gail Hughes, our Book Club Coordinator, and Dre Drea Bergman-Klein, our Programs and Campaigns Manager. And today is our second session, Reading Union Now by Clarence Streit. And we are pleased once again to have Tiziana Stella, the Executive Director of the Streit Council, join us as we focus on chapters two, three, and four. Now, last month I was on vacation, but I understand that there were some technical problems, so we don't have the video for that session. So Tiziana will also give a brief overview of chapter one, um, which we discussed last time. So people who were not on the call last time can hear it and also we'll have it on the recording as well since we won't have the recording for chapter one. So we'll proceed as usual uh, with Tiziana pointing out what uh, she feels are the highlights and main takeaways of those chapters and then we'll open it up for questions and discussion. Um, I'll ask everybody as a reminder to go on mute during this portion of the presentation um, and also go back on mute when you're not speaking or asking a question. And we will, um, we, you know, people are welcome to use the chat as always, but we will not be monitoring it. So if you wanna ask a question, uh, please raise your cyber hand, which is the easiest for me to see. And then after I clear the decks on all the cyber hands raised, if folks either don't have that function or don't know how to use it, uh, then you could raise your flesh and blood hand. And it's uh, helpful to raise it right in front of you so I see it, not off to the side where I might not see it. Uh, things are a little different in cyberspace. Um, so, and Andrea will also be monitoring chat in case there are any technical issues. So if your sound cuts out or anything like that, please put a, uh, a message in the chat and it would be helpful to Drea if you put it in all caps so she can see it standing out from the rest of the discussion. As always, we'll stop about 10 minutes before the session ends uh, so that um, people can make any kind of announcements they wanna make about either events they, they, they wanna announce or books they're promoting or anything of that sort. And like always, if anyone joins the session in the middle and we don't recognize them or don't recognize their phone number, if that's all that's there, um, we will stop for a moment and ask them to identify themselves uh, because we want to avoid hackers and Zoom bombers and all those other nasty things that sometimes happen in cyberspace. So at this point, I would <laughs> introduce our speaker but it looks like she is still having some difficulties getting on audio. Um, Drea, do we have any communication with her? Not yet. Okay, well, in that case, um, what I will do is open the floor. Um, I mean, presumably everyone's read, if not all of the chapters, or at least most of them. Um, and if there's anything that, that stands out for you, um, about the readings or any questions you want to ask Tiziana later on when she gets on. I'll just open the floor for any general discussion um, on the book and hopefully she'll be joining us um, and, you know, fully um, within a few moments. So any um, questions or discussion or whatever? Well, I'll open up because um, I, I, I have been reading it. Uh, even though I wasn't here last time, I'll open up and, and just say that um, I was very um, impressed. And, and, and as I'm sure you discussed last time, um, this was one of the seminal books that was written about World Federation before World War II. So it, it, it preceded essentially all the other books that we've read so far. And, um, and Streit's clarity, his, his straightforwardness of his argument in writing, um, I was just really taken aback by it. I mean, in a positive way. Um, and I also um, hadn't really considered the idea of unifying the democracies as the, the, the kernel of, of building a world federation. 
And he really, I found myself very convinced uh, by his argument. So I just want to share, share that impression um, thus far. Any other impressions of the reading so far? Yes, Carla May. I, I just want to add on to that, um, Bob. Is there, is, to anyone's knowledge, has anything been taken up seriously by this? Is, is there any effort to make this real? Or is it just an idea back from the 30s that we're just recovering at this time? Yeah. So I, I, I see Tiziana's coming on, but while she's getting her picture and all that, I will, um, I'll, I'll respond with what I know. And I, I see David's hand is up as well. Um, that um, certainly um, the Strike Council, which is the organization that Tiziana runs, I see we, we have her fully now, um, is working to promote this. And the only other organization that I know of um, and the person who heads it is in Australia, Chris Hamer, um, his, his, promosal, his proposal um, to create what he calls a security community of nations. Um, and, and looking at it, you know, organizing around security and then building in other things after that. So there's at least two other organizations that I know, but since we have the star of the show, um, I want to turn things over to her. Uh, Tiziana, oh, and let me, let me get David in because you already had your hand up and then I'll turn it over to our, our featured presenter. David? I just wanted to respond to Carla May briefly that the most recent idea of uniting the democracies was promoted by John McCain during oh. a, the 2008 presidential uh, um, debates. Uh, that that was something that the Republicans seemed, at least the more liberal Republicans were, um, uh, they would go along with uniting the democracies before a full-fledged world federation. Great, good. Okay, well, this sounds like the, the perfect moment to make the transition. So, uh, Tiziana, um, you can see us and hear us now? Yeah, I can see you all. Can you hear me? Absolutely. Okay, so with that, I will turn it over to Tiziana. I've already introduced the session, so take it away. All right, thank you to everybody. Can you all hear me well? Yes, all right. So uh, I, I prepared a PowerPoint presentation and I hope it will work. And uh, I would like to go back and uh, start uh, reviewing a little bit uh, the first chapter and then moving on to the other sections that we were supposed to read today. Um, and uh, here, let me see if I can make it work. Uh, share screen. So I'm trying to share my screen. There it is. Can you all see it? Yes. Perfect. I made it. Right. Uh, let's see if I can actually uh, make it work. Uh, oh God. I have to make it a bit smaller. Sorry. I have. All right, I um, think I'm there. All right, so uh, what I like to talk today is a little bit, you know, what we have been reading, uh, but in uh, the bigger concept of world organization to, to democracy, which was, you know, in the 1930s was Strides Wager. So he uh, was concerned at the time. At the time, he was a journalist at the League of Nations. And, uh, he was able to see that the league uh, was not uh, able to manage the uh, world security and the economic crisis. And at the same time, there was also what we have today, this degeneration of democracy, backsliding of democracy. So his uh, observation at the time he was a journalist and at the time he was not, he was not a federalist. He did not believe when he, uh, went at the league very much uh, on the on the league of nation the ability of world organization to 
promote what he thought was the most important thing, democracy, because his main concern since he was like growing up was always uh, how uh, to defend democracy, especially the individual uh, in the system of new complexities that interdependence was creating. So uh, his concern that uh, he saw that the crisis of democracy and the crisis of world organization were happening at the same time, and they were part of one problem. The problem had to be looked at in terms of democracy and world organization. So his wager was that there was a way out of what we know in terms of the feasible versus desirable dilemma, and that required to do enough uh, while it was a window of opportunity, but at the same time, not to lose uh, perspective of uh, why and who will benefit from doing enough. So, uh, so I will try to discuss about uh, why this is, was relevant at the time, uh, what it tells us about where we are today, uh, the, the relevance for democracy at the time and now, what democracies, their foreign policy, and the debate on global governance and world organizations are missing in light of Stray's perspective. But, and Tiziana, pardon me for interrupting, but if you could either speak a little bit louder or lean into your microphone, oh, that, right. would, that would be helped. Much better. Thank you. All right. Okay. Is it better? Much better. Thank you. All right, so the main thing I was trying to say that this concern was doing enough, but also doing enough uh, with keeping in mind who's going, who would be benefiting. And in his uh, conception, uh, the individual always had to be the priority uh, of uh, who would be benefiting from the transformations in governance that uh, uh, we were implementing. So, uh, Strauss world government is very relevant when we think about democracy, domestic and international. So in terms of his uh, personal evolution, he, can you all hear me well now? Yes. Yes. Much better. So in terms of his personal evolution, so he, he grew up in Montana and he was originally a socialist. He was, uh, uh, his mother uh, gave him a lot, imparting on him a lot of the spirit of the reform movement. Um, progressivism at the time, the idea of egalitarianism, the idea of helping the poor, the less uh, privileged. And so uh, he started as a journalist actually when he was in very young, like in even in elementary school. And uh, he moved on to college and they started a newspaper, The Conan. Uh, and uh, in there we see already like the importance that uh, he um, gave to the idea of democracy uh, understood as substantial democracy as opposed to uh, procedural democracy. And uh, at the time, I'm very much inclined to... Uh, can you see my old screen? Because I have on the top uh, of my screen, I cannot see the, the top of my uh, slide. Can you see the old thing? Yes. All right. Okay. Good. Um, so uh, originally, so uh, I I heard somebody bringing up the issue that uh, uh, the idea of a union democracy is an idea that uh, Republican or Republicans also like, uh, and usually the idea of a union democracy is in uh, you know associated more uh, with um, the uh, right to the center, center, as opposed to the left, Stride has been accused of, you know, being like a cold warrior and all that. Actually, his origins were very much like in the uh, socialist movement at the time. Uh, so here I have a quote uh, that can help uh, contextualize uh, the, uh, the ideas of Stride later on. So this, we, we're talking about 1917. So it was a 21 year old. It was in high school at the time. Um, and it was saying, what, what is the battlefield of democracy today? 
The obvious answer is, of course, in the trenches of Europe. But there is another form to democracy, even more fundamental, more dangerous, because less easily recognized. That is the autocracy based on the possession of riches, born of political systems which permit a grossly unjust distribution of wealth. So that is where it started, this concern of how the um, complexities of the new interdependences were creating in the industrial society, were creating winners and losers, and the individual was helpless in, uh, uh, within these new complexities. Uh, so uh, for him, the role of government, he had this pragmatic view of government, was um, leadership, expertise, and democratic participation that need, were needed to restore the fabric of uh, democratic societies and find new reinvigorated so, uh, societal solidarities. So this uh, model that he saw applied at the beginning um, to the, uh, the how to restore the balance in a democratic society internally, um, then he uh, wonder why uh, the same model was not also applied to the problems of international interdependence that he had noticed when he was at the league. Why democracy was not being also implemented in the same way that had been implemented by pragmatic government internally at the international level. So, um, this also tied for him. Um, sorry, yeah, this is better. So, with uh, the idea that he developed and that was very strong in him, the idea of indi individual conscience, that at the foundation of societal solidarity is this sense of freedom and duty that uh, each of us uh, has internally that ties to individual conscience. And um, this trait uh, of uh, individual agency is what was the fabric of democratic society and is lost when the individual is elbowed out in an age of what he called mass scale drama played by collective nouns. Uh, and this bring to individual alienation and eventually also to the collapse of uh, um, the fabric of democratic society. So that's why it was for him also very important that uh, the focus of governance was the individual and uh, returning uh, individual agency and the ability of the individual to um, have an impact and feel that as a role in society. Um, so another thing that um, usually Stripe has been uh, accused of um, by his detractor was that his model was, well, too much based on the American uh, constitution. Uh, it was uh, trying to impose, superimpose this model on the rest of the world. And uh, Stride at the time had a very difficult uh, strategy because what he wanted to try to achieve was to get Americans to pay attention to the problem of the necessity of world government. And so uh, part of the rhetoric that we see in the book is really geared toward getting Americans engaged, but also because it did happen that the American experiment really pointed very uh, specifically to the problems that it was observing at the league. So uh, one thing that um, Stride tried to impart and very successfully actually uh, on uh, the people around him and also that is why I think also is a movement as such a great impact uh, at the beginning of World War II was that uh, he uh, projected this idea that uh, international federation is the ability to, uh, of engagement to have engagement without entanglements. Um, 
and that Americans had actually fell into this trap, this, um, that he thought it was just a, a conceptual trap of absolute national sovereignty. Um, and um, sorry, I'm trying to move something on my screen, otherwise I cannot see. The state was a means that was there to safeguard the equal, equal individual freedom, which by the word freedom, uh, we also have to contextualize the word freedom. What uh, for stride the word freedom meant safety and emancipation, the possibility and the uh, of each to, uh, to be further emancipated, which society needed to guarantee. So freedom needs to be understood as safety, but also as a possibility of emancipation. And uh, how uh, other options of international organization like neutrality, balance of power, alliance, or League of Nations, uh, they cannot protect substantive democracy. That with all options of international organization, uh, democracy could at best stay alive in terms of procedural democracy, but not substantive democracy. So the idea that the government is a means to an end, the idea that all men at the time, men at the time was okay, uh, are created equal and governments are instituted to secure certain inalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Uh, this was a very much an American idea that Americans had to think about at the time of the interwar, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new interstate government. The other point that he really stressed a lot uh, with Americans and that um, resonated uh, was that, uh, as opposed to alliances and as opposed to intergovernmental organizations that could be set up without the agreement of the people, without the agreement of the people that are uh, uh, the basis of democracy, union cannot happen. And so uh, this idea of the consent of the governed is very important in stride. The idea that uh, international organizations to be legitimate as to have the uh, um, to be um, as to have the consent of the governed. So there is this quote: "All it will take to make this union, whether in a thousand years or now, whether long after catastrophe or just in time to prevent it, is agreement by a majority to do it. Union is the one of those is one of those things which." to do, we need but agree to do, and which we cannot possibly ever do except by agreeing to do it. So this idea of agreeing, this idea of uh, consent that uh, was very critical for strike. So this entitled the popular mandate without which government becomes an end in itself, an aberration from the principle of democracy. And so in those days, uh, he, uh, presented the idea in this way, and uh, the conclusion was that one cannot be for liberty and against union in the moder moder modern world of interdependence. So um, I think that we should stop one second. Uh, maybe I will not. Uh, I won't. I won't go uh, through everything, but on how he saw union as just. Uh, an extension of democracy, but not as global democracy because it did not um, support that idea. Uh, but uh, so um, <clears throat> while the league was also, uh, it showed how it was not uh, a model of international organization that was based on non-democracy and actually was anti-democracy and would uh, eventually, uh, lead to the generation of democracy uh, and nominal democracy. 
So um, he defined democracy, and that is, uh, I think also we should focus on his definition of democracy as government by the people, for the people, and of the people, composed of individuals, all given equal weight. And it's the way to individual freedom formed by men organizing themselves on the principle of equality of men. So the unit of government is the person. They organize government of themselves in the sense that their laws operate on them individually as equals by themselves, each having an equal vote in making law for themselves to secure equally the freedom in the broadest possible sense of the term of each of them. By democracy, I mean uh, government of the totality by the majority for the sake equally of each minority or one. And so then by extension, the union is a democracy composed of democracies, an interstate government organized on the same basic principle by the same basic method for the same basic purpose as the democracies in it. And with the powers of government divided between the union and the states, the better to advance uh, this common purpose, individual freedom. So, and then he, he explained very well, and I think that that is also why it was so successful in uh, uh, getting uh, his movement started and it was so impactful on American foreign policy, um, that union and league are actually opposite terms. Uh, and it, it divides all organizations of interstate, rela of interstate relations into two types, according to whether man, the person, uh, or the state is the unit, or and the equality of the person or the equality of the state is the principle it lives and it keeps alive. And it, there is a chapter later on in the book where it really shows in details why by choosing this different unit, uh, this unit would determine the end goal of Inter, um, international organization. And that it was not the statement of principles or the wish or uh, what the organization wanted to be the end result uh, that would determine the end result, but rather the unit that it was based upon that eventually would determine if this organization could work and if it could save democracy at the same time. Um, so, um, Stride participated in World War I, and he participated despite the fact, in spite of the fact he was against the war, but because he believed, like many in his generation, that the war could bring up a league, and this league uh, would uh, remove power politics from international relations, uh, bring democracy, say, and uh, also uh, peace. Um, and so he espoused this idea and uh, entered the war. Uh, however, uh, he was also a bodyguard to Wilson and uh, um, saw uh, firsthand uh, the documents uh, among the powers that were um, discussing the settlement at Versailles. And uh, um, that uh, created him. Um, phase of disillusionment, like many, others, many, many other Americans, uh, in which he uh, came to distrust um, the goals of the League. Uh, but when uh, he went to the League of Nations, um, he could then, at that time, you know, look at why this idea that has already been theorized of the possibility of a world federation um, was, uh, how, sorry, these ideas that had already been theorized uh, as the possibility of world federation uh, could actually work. So the experience at the league uh, was important. As I said, there were, you noticed that there was the generation backsliding of democracy in the 1930s. The League did not bring peace and democracy at uh, people at hope and its generation hoped. 
but uh, world economic and security crisis. At that point, um, he started to think why is that um, the lead democracies um, that themselves had been unions of unions did not unite once more. What was preventing democracies from uniting once more? And uh, at that point, he identified that the principle of uh, absolute uh, national sovereignty that was preventing this uh, um, mentally. He thought it was like a mental confusion, actually, uh, prevent to apply democracy also at the international level. So Stride understands democracy as equality, social justice, substantive democracy. And uh, at the time, uh, he, um, when he writes Union Now, and before that, that was in the 19, early 1930s, he was like, he accused uh, democracies of being the cause of uh, uh, both the failure of the League and uh, of uh, the rise um, of dictatorships in younger democracies, the strengthening of autocracy in the world, uh, because they have been unable to apply the same principles that they were applying internally, also internationally. Uh, and he also formulates this um, projected that the best case scenario uh, that a union could uh, generate was uh, potentially positive peace after the creation of the union. So the union is not a panacea, is not where everything is realized, but is the precondition to avoid collapse, at two, is the precondition to positive use of technology, um, and is the precondition to human and other than human survival, what we talk today about we define today as planetary. It can reach universality via individual equality. And uh, what I said earlier on, the union also projected the idea of engagement without entanglement, mean, meaning also uh, overcoming power politics and international relations. The league uh, at the same time was uh, non-democratic, was not just non-democratic, was anti-democratic. It would cause degeneration of democracy, it was not just stable, it would just bring democracy down um, because uh, it will um, uh, support, uh, continue a situation of international anarchy. Uh, the best case scenario uh, for a league organization, uh, intergovernmental organizations were periods of negative peace, which will become progressively less likely because of technology, the advancement of technology, the impact of what he called machine in the life of people and democracy, and an ultimate collapse of democracy uh, because of this technological acceleration. Um, the idea of universality in a league was based on the idea of equal sovereignty of nation states. Uh, the peace depended upon balance of power or hegemony or collective security ultimately depended on war, uh, on ultimately would always be determined, uh, change would always be determined by war. Uh, the end of the league the, the, was the survival of the nation states. Um, and because of that, uh, it would deprioritize democracy, disarmament, social justice, and peace. So, uh, Stride, uh, when he was at the League of Nations, uh, so also that there were a lot of proposals at the time on how to reform the League. And the main problems that uh, were on the table were uh, the idea of a universality, that the League had to be universal, uh, the organization had to be global, worldwide, and at the same time, uh, there was also uh, the problem of democracy. So he uh, 
um, conceptualize a union of democracies as a way to uh, move from league to federation. The league was a government of governments by governments and for governments. And uh, it would enshrine the equal sovereignty of states, which now is enshrined in the League of Na in the United Nations. Instead, the union was uh, a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. And it would enshrine instead the idea of equality of individuals. So it seems that there was uh, like a dilemma between these two models and uh, how to move from a system that is based on equal sovereignty of states to a system that is based on equal sovereignty, uh, equality of individuals. So in that sense, he, uh, the, the idea of the nucleus of democracy was uh, conceptualized to allow gradually to move uh, from equal sovereignty of states to equality of the individuals, therefore universality with democracy. So um, more in details, he also <clears throat> explained why the League would always sacrifice the right of individuals to justice and to equal voting power. Um, and we don't need to read this, uh, it's already in the book, but he went uh, to great length to explain why uh, a system of intergovernmental organization would always sacrifice these individual rights. And uh, um, so in terms of, sorry, uh, how do I go back now? Sorry, I need to go back. Um, all right. Okay. So the other thing that uh, usually is uh, a misperceived uh, in Stride is um, the idea that he proposed a union of democracies as an alternative to the League or as an alternative to the United Nations. That was not the case. He always thought of the nucleus as a way to move the League uh, to become a universal uh, organization based on the equality of the individuals and similarly the UN. So the nucleus was not to supplant but to reinforce the League and strengthen democracy. The League was not working because of international anarchy, so the thing that needed to be removed was international anarchy and democracies had enough weight at the time uh, that their union could supplant de facto anarchy at the world level and so it was a way to start this movement away from international anarchy and power politics. And it also would strengthen democracy uh, because what he observed uh, differently from uh, the federalists of the past, like Mazzini that thought that the more Kantian idea we could first uh, spread democracy at the national level. Eventually, these democracies could all cooperate. Uh, it could even uh, unite in a federation. But what became clear in the interwar is that uh, because of technological acceleration, the two steps had to be inverted. Democracies had to unite in order to remove anarchy so that this anarchy will not bring to the degeneration of democracy, collapse of democracy, and for making this movement toward world federation always elusive. Always, it will never start, it would always be later. So usually, uh, and this was uh, part of the debate also uh, that preceded the UN, uh, was that the League and the Union were seen as an either or options, either a universal league or a universal union. 
and the uh, Universal Union Federation was always unfeasible. Uh, the league was feasible, but at, this, at the cost of not removing anarchy, and therefore at the cost of making international organization, world organizations, a world organization not effective. So uh, Strive thought that it was possible to do both at the same time, not only, but also. So it was possible to have an in universal intergovernmental world organization where states were uh, the principle of equal sovereignty of states was uh, the, the basis of the union. And at the same time, uh, have a an open nucleus of democracies within the uh, uh, universal um, organization. Now, the idea was that because it was based on the individual, uh, the, the fact that the unit was the individual, the, uni the union could grow into an universality. And I will go into that later on. He uh, was very clear in the book, I think it's chapter two, that he said that the problem, the most urgent problem for the world was creating a world government. However, he said, that doesn't mean that we can create it all at once. And uh, he also looked at other options that were on the table, like the idea of an alliance of democracies and he criticized that on, uh, and I will go into that later. But again, going back to the problem that the most urgent problem was the, the problem of world government. And that, that world government had to be based on the idea of democracy and universality. The nucleus could remove now, and that was the important thing, it had to start at that moment. It cannot be procrastinated because there was this window of opportunity to remove anarchy and to start disarmament. And uh, without removing anarchy, this crisis of the international organization democracy would never be overcome, would always be there. So I'll... Tiziana, let me, just cut, let me just cut in to point out that we're about the halfway point of the entire session, both your presentation and the, and the questions and answers. Okay, just wanted I'm to let you know. I, I don't have much more. Um, Terrific, so, just letting you know. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. So, um, the nucleus was also, so was it a synthesis um, between the met two methods, the method of the league and the method of federation. Uh, the concern was, as I was saying, not to forever delay altering power politics, uh, which would in turn uh, become a danger, an existential danger for democracy. The actual choice was instead between a democratic nucleus of world federation within universal cooperation, that could say democracy and world organization, as opposed to universal cooperation without federation, which would weaken democracy and lead to cycles of hegemonic rivalry in the perennial competition for supremacy. Um, one would lead to peace and disarmament, the other would consolidate new levels of power politics where democracy might not survive. And that this idea that democracy might not survive becomes important and very relevant today. Then uh, it was also like a synthesis of membership because uh, at the time at the league, there were other ideas that were proposed. Uh, there were non-universal non unions, but those cannot evolve into universality. They were based uh, on ideas of regionalism, great powers, or other ideas were the English speaking union, but th their traits, their basic traits cannot allow them to grow into universality. So um, the open federal nucleus of democracies uh, was um, the synthesis, uh, democracy was not only the criteria of membership because that would create a, a league of democracies and that cannot overcome the basic problem of anarchy, but also the method of union with individual as unit of government at the core of world organization the nucleus could organically grow into universality. And this is the basic difference between a union and an alliance of democracies. So um, 
I can uh, uh, maybe skip over this. We can go over another time. But again, you, you consider the union as this uh, breakthrough, this uh, that could create this moment of rupture with power politics and was the precondition to survive a democracy and growth into universal world democratic federation. Um, another important thing was the idea of unbalance of power, which uh, also has been criticized and it can be criticized, but for, for stride was important because uh, without removing anarchy, disarmament can never start. Without disarmament starting, uh, there will be perennial power, uh, power politics. Um, so, uh, Strait also focused on the idea of how the machine technology today uh, made world government a uh, priority. And yes, and he criticized how other methods would not work. Uh, um, one thing that uh, we need to think about and I wanted to uh, stress is how is a uh, model really um, brings a new perspective on what should be the foreign policy of the democracies in a different paradigm. Uh, and there is this famous quote by Stride that, that really captures uh, why. Uh, the dictators are right when they blame the democracies for the world's condition, but they are wrong when they blame it on democracy. The anarchy comes from the refusal of the democracies to renounce enough of their national sovereignty to let effective world law and order be set up. By their refusal to do this, their maintenance of the state for its own sake, their readiness to sacrifice the lives and liberties of the citizens rather than the independence of the state, this we know is not democracy. It is the core of absolutism. Democracy has been winning and autocracy waxing. The rights of men lessening and the rights of the state growing everywhere because the leading democracies have themselves led in practicing beyond their frontiers autocracy instead of democracy. And this is really relevant today. It's like, I think it's really the core of uh, uh, the problems that we're facing today uh, in uh, uh, the ideas of uh, and the foreign policies of democracies all over. And then he also, uh, theory, uh, um, states why union is different from an alliance. It is wrong or wrong to conceive of union as aimed against the nations of the triangle, the autocracies at the time. There is a world of difference between the motives, the motives be behind union and those behind either the present policy in each democracy of arming for itself or the proposals for alliance among the democracies. For such armament and such alliance are meant to maintain the one thing union does attack in the one place union that's attacked. Autocratic principles are absolute national sovereignty in the democracies. Unlike armament and alliance policies, union leads to no crusade against autocracy abroad, to not attempt to end war by war or make the war safe for democracy by conquering foreign dictatorships. And then he, he really uh, focused on the responsibility of democracies to change uh, international order. Uh, there is this quote that he brings up from Bullet that it is not enough to observe with a sense of superiority the worst mistake of the new fanaticism. The origins of those fanaticisms lie in part in our own unwisdom. Um, and again, he, at the end, he also warned against the dangers of the resurgence of anarchy at the end of the Cold War if democracies failed to unite through the democratic procedures of federation. What we have today are greater threats than uh, those in the interwar years, but the sources are not dissimilar. As Stride uh, pointed out, the autocratic governments are adding to the world's ill, but they are not the real cause of them. They are instead an effect of the anarchy among the powerful democracies. When the really powerful members of a community refuse to organize effective government in it, when each insists on remaining alone to itself, to the degree that democracy, and especially the United States, have done since the war, then anarchy is bound to res result. 
So, and uh, I think I have just two more slides. I'm gonna go really quick. So I was, at, I was trying here to, not very successfully because I'm not, but uh, show the relationship between interdependence, technological acceleration, how the impact of anarchy in, on the individual grows exponentially as with technological acceleration uh, and the, the ability of national democracy to uphold substantial democracy uh, becomes impossible. Uh, so there's the different uh, variables here, uh, technology, substantial democracy, uh, greater destructiveness of a great power competition because of a worse technology, uh, the impact of this anarchy on individuals and the sense of uh, alienation, the stability and, uh, and how this also bring to the generation of democracy and uh, most importantly, the overall chances of moving beyond anarchy. Because as time progresses, the chances of moving beyond anarchy on the basis of a union of democracy are less and less. So uh, this is just meant to have uh, uh, maybe a discussion uh, within the context of technology, data, finances, and big tech and existential risk. Uh, what are the overall chances of moving beyond anarchy with democracy? And what would be the program for substantive, sub, substantive democracy? Uh, what we have on the table now uh, uh, is the UN that is trying to move forward with um, sustainable developmental goals, the summit of the future in conjunction with the G7, OECD and the G20. Um, that is facing at the same time great power competition and technological exceptionalism. Uh, On the other side, uh, we have, and, 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 and in this model also, there is the idea of a rule-based international order uh, that uh, also embedded, and in that is also this idea of democracy versus autocracy. And we see like the stride really pointed out that that was, uh, wasn't the main problem, wasn't the main um, way to conceptualize how to move beyond um, the present system of uh, great power competition and, pos and potentially um, existential risk that we cannot manage. I think I'm done. Yeah. Okay. I'm done. Well, thank you so much. If you would stop sharing your screen, we could all see each other again, and then we could move to the, uh, to the questions and comments. Um, I again ask people to raise their cyber hand, which you can do by bringing your cursor down to the bottom of your screen. Uh, I, I think most computers have it there, the reactions, and you click on that and, and it say raise hand there. If not, I'll take si you know, flesh hands uh, after I clear the cyber hands. And also um, I ask people uh, to be brief in their questions or comments so we can get everyone in. And there was a request, uh, Tiziana, um, if you can share your slides. Um, so I'm not going to put you on the spot, but if you're willing to share it with the group, um, you could send it to me and we will send it out to the group, um, okay. if that's okay with you. So <laughs> we can decide on that. So, um, so at this time, I'll take any questions. If there are hands, you could raise them now. Okay, Gail. Um, yeah, the definition of democracy um, in in your slides, you know, I, I, it seems to me like those are those would represent real democracies. But you know, the question I had last time was there were fifteen countries, so-called democracies, that were listed and included were was South Africa, which at the time was um, you know apartheid. It was definitely not, it did not fit the definition of what you put up on the, the board there, you know, where 
Yeah, people could vote, but only it was only 5% of the people. It was only the whites. So um, I'm not sure how many countries in the world would fit <laughs> the democracy, democracy as defined. I mean, that's an ideal definition of democracy. I'm not sure there's a single country in the world that would fit that. And so um, what do you do with countries that have some elements of that, but not others and and so on. Anyway, it sounds, it seems just the definition is difficult here. Uh, yeah, well, so two observations on that. On one side, uh, Stride was um, also a practical person and uh, he, um, at the time, uh, understood that there should be enough um, th th there were other things that I didn't go in, in the slide through and uh, his idea that this union had to have enough internal cohesion, it had to have a certain degree of homogeneity and that was important in order to for countries to agree to unite in such a deep way that is a federation. So you have the problem of how do you create a union that is so deep the level of union that is so deep that is federation uh, with countries that are not homogeneous. And, and so he thought that uh, that was the best groups of countries that could uh, guarantee what an imbalance of power. The imbalance of power element was critical in his strategy because the union would have to be able to defend itself not by armaments and not by war. And so in order to remove the whole idea of power politics and in order to create something that was so stable and so strong that could gradually bring to further disarmament that, that would eliminate war. So it was a bet, it was a wager at that point. How do we move from here to there and decide this is probably how we can do it. It wasn't perfect uh, and he got criticized a lot for that. Uh, as to the concept of, you know, are we all nominal democracies today? Maybe to a certain degree we do, we are nominal democracies. Therefore, uh, and I think that in that, uh, there is a lot to be said about how uh, from, you know, the relation between the generation of democracy, not real sustainable democracy is not possible as long as there is great power competition. And so you have the idea that only, you know, the real democracy eventually could be um, started. And that was the, the big point, started at the time when there is a world federation. It's not that we achieve real democracy. There are many issues that would have to be still more uh, decided, discussed, and there should be further progress in the direction of substantive democracy. But without that step, it would be even impossible to contemplate because there will be less and less substantive democracy. So that's my Thank answer. You. Thank you. Um, I put myself in the queue, but I'll let Carla May get in there first. Go ahead. Just uh, to continue that discussion, um, to Diana, um, it would seem to me from what you've presented that his whole vision is progressive. That it is not that, that these are static categories, that, that he's trying to, at least your diagrams, try to capture that this is a movement. This is a progression from one state to the other. And it is going to be imperfect. But if it, but he he's very clear that if these values are not core to the movement, it will be stillborn. Yeah, correct. I yeah, uh, that's very much what he was trying to grasp and say and convey. Uh, that the critical thing is to do what is enough and to do it where there is a window of opportunity. Because as we move along more and more, this will become more difficult. Like and now today, big tech has such a great um, power uh, in uh, the world and how decisions are made. 
uh, they have to be included as what we call the stakeholders. Um, technology, this exceptionalism of technology is becoming more and more ingrained in the system and is more and more difficult for government to uh, eliminate. And so the more we move, the more there is the power of destructiveness of weapons like uh, nuclear weapons, the more it, it becomes difficult to start to achieve the beginning stage because it becomes more and more elusive uh, and more and more out of grasp. So that is one of the concerns that um, is obviously grown much bigger as time uh, you know, moved on. And, uh, but yes, yes, this progressive and, and, and the idea that even when we reach this union, let's say we reach this world federation, it's not gonna be that at that point, all the problems are solved. It's just, we can start thinking of them. We, before that, we cannot even focus on them as a priority. They get the prioritized because of other issues are more important. Great. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll jump in the queue. Um, I, I was very struck by how much um, or how, how, you know, how much he was predicting the world today when I read about, you know, the backsliding of democracies and the rise of autocracy. I mean, you know, I, I was kind of shocked. It's like, wow, this guy is like really right on, you know. And um, but the you know, and, and it made his argument that much more compelling. But I think the fear that I have is that if let's say we did this, you know, if, if, if the democracy started organizing and, and a number of people, you know, have already said that is this leading to a new bipolar world, you know, of the democracies, you know, versus let's say Russia and China and the rest of the quote axis of evil, you know, does it make things more entrenched um, and make it harder to get out of and then achieve an eventual world federation with some, you know, semblance of universality and, and more countries coming in and all that. So I, I guess, how do you um, do this, you know, which, which seems so um, attractive, you know, and at the same time avoid the downside um, that seems so like looming <laughs> in the yeah. distance and also, um, you know, while you're doing this, what's the best way to relate to the autocracies to not turn them into enemies, you know, to, to, to keep the, the community, you know, the channels open, to keep the invitation open, to switch over? I mean, how do you deal with all that? Um, so that's my question. And, and I will say that, that in the World Federalist Movement, not, not only my organization, but in, in WFM as a whole, we're doing long-term planning right now and asking these kinds of questions. Um, so let me turn it over to you for the answer. Thank you. Okay, so what I think, I think that uh, what I was trying to stress in my presentation, it was very clear uh, that, and we discussed this a little bit uh, in the previous session, it was very clear that he saw at that moment um, the moment of opportunity was now. And uh, it was possible at that point uh, for democracies to really create this uh, overwhelming, um, what do you call it? this overwhelming uh, consolidation of power on the side of democracy without having so much of what we have today with, uh, you know, development of uh, other existential risks that then in the meanwhile, uh, they arose, uh, and so there is this path dependency that uh, the more we move on, the more this um, possibility gets out of hand. So if you were to do it today, um, first of all, um, by not doing, we are not avoiding the problems that you mentioned. It's like, uh, is the policy of the foreign policies of democracies now not creating like uh, autocracies to uh, join and to unite against them, it is. So it's not that we have an alternative by which we wouldn't have that. At the same time, 
we are also uh, projecting and continuing uh, this power politics, correct? Which is very much against them. And, and it's, it's also very uh, much noticed by the Global South, the, um, you know, hypocritical, uh, the hypocritical way of uh, uh, the democracies have to uh, deal with foreign policy. And that is creating a space for uh, autocratic governments uh, to have a lot of appeal in the global south. Uh, so th that is also what we are losing the battles of ideas. But the other thing is, I do not think that today we can do like, you know, in the 90, in the 1930s or early 40s, um, the same. That would have to be much more. Um, Strengthening of uh, uh, the universal uh, functions, like and uh, cooperation along functional lines with whoever wants to cooperate, and so stating what are the problems and cooperation has to be wide open. Uh, but it doesn't mean that democracies at the same time cannot decide that they will unite. And there is nobody that can prevent democracies from uniting. There is nothing that they are doing against anybody by uniting. Actually, they can, uh, by doing that, prove that they're serious about democracy, as opposed to being unserious and using democracy like as a propaganda machine. Um, so uh, I think the dynamics are a little bit different today and uh, what is uh, possible and uh, one will have to think it through in a different way, but by not doing, we're not avoiding that problem. And by doing, we could actually show that we're serious about wanting to change international order and changing this order uh, for the sake of democracy. Without doing that, when we continue to say it in uh, the rule-based international order, it, it's, it's not democracy. So, uh, and it's very clear by now uh, to everybody, and it's very clear in the global south, uh, and uh, continue on this path is really anti, it, it's not just anti-democratic because it's gonna bring down democracy internally, but it's also anti-democratic because uh, it, as a method, it's not democratic. And so it, it becomes, it, it's become untenable also in terms of ideology and it's, it's already passed. So either we move to something else or uh, I, I don't think that there is any other, um, I think democracies are gonna, um, be more and more on the spot for not uh, being coherent uh, on these things. Good, thank you. Um, I'll bring Simon in and then I saw Colin May's hand. If there's any, after Simon, if there's anyone else who hasn't come in for the first time, I'll recognize them or else we'll go to Colin May to start our second round. Um, so Simon, oh, then I see David Gallup. Go ahead, Simon. Zama, thank you, thank you so much uh, for a a uh, great uh, summary of uh, the Union Now book by Strait. Uh, and he alluded to, uh, briefly to a concept of a supra-sovereign uh, laws, uh, but at that time he did not elaborate it. Um, now, supra-sovereign laws or supranational laws are really the major requirement, which is not discussed in this book, for a union or a federation to take place. In other words, as long as there are sovereign states that can do whatever they want without interference by another state, union cannot occur. For union to take place, there have to be supranational laws to which national states have to obey and to subordinate their sovereign and national laws to the supranational laws. And then it will be successful to have a union from that, a federation. That's my opinion. And, and, and the example of that that has succeeded is of course, as we all know, the European Union, which abandoned national laws and established supranational laws and was successful in bringing 28 uh, 
different uh, uh, sovereign states together, uh, with the exception of uh, Britain exiting. Now there are 27 states, 500 million people, the largest democracy of um, union um, super with a union in the in the world, and they, as we know, uh, they were awarded a Nobel Peace Prize in 2012 for their achievement as the greatest achievement in history. Thank you, Simon. Tiziana, any comment? Yeah, I'm trying to find a slide actually that I had that was um, dealing with the problem that. Okay. Um, and constant. while you're looking, let me just point out we've got about 10 minutes left. So I want to make sure we get everyone in and oh, also have so our time gonna, for announcement. I'm going to, uh, so I will just summarize it. Okay. So, yeah, yes, uh, I agree with that. And uh, maybe um, Stride did not um, speak, uh, not make that point uh, uh, a prevalent point, but the idea that law within the union would be supranational is clear when it speaks about how there will be a different kind of law within a union. That union is supranational. And in order to move from international law to supranational law, you have to create a union. And without a union, you cannot have supranational law. So he went about that as if you law within the state, the creation of the state that is the union, and then law is supranational. So, uh, because again, it was looking more in terms of a progress a movement from one uh, national law to international law through union. Great, thank you. Okay, uh, David, I see your hand is down now. Did you bring it down deliberately or you're still waiting to go? David Gallup? Yeah, no, uh, can you see me? Can you yes. Me? Okay, yeah. yeah, no, I'm ready. Yeah, so one of the, in the theory of change of Citizens for Global Solutions, one of the sectors of society we're talking about reaching is corporations. I haven't finished reading Union now. So my question, I'll, I'll ask the question, but then I'll follow it up with just a quick statement. Um, I think we need to be getting to uh, corporations in that sector society, maybe even more than we already are. And so I wanna ask the question, Tiziana, about whether, uh, um, uh, uh, um, Strite would have uh, how you extrapolate his ideas from union now to deal with corporations in a sense governing our world. I kind of feel like the big machine now is is Amazon.com or Lockheed Martin in production in production of weapons. And and as we as individuals through our bank accounts or our credit cards or whatever, we're investing really maybe not even knowing it in in building bombs and building weapons or supporting uh, corporations that do that. Um, I guess. I feel like we need to deal with corporations as an organization or, or even as the World Federalist Movement more than we are. So how, how do you see uh, Stride uh, maybe extrapolate his ideas from the, you know, the 30s or 40s into dealing with corporations in a sense as, a, as already a world government that's, that's governing us behind the scenes? Um, I think that <clears throat> Stride, uh, um, what, this idea of, uh, this is what we are dealing with now because we have the, the problem in front of us. We have these corporations, big tech, that have this power and we have to deal with that and we have tried to engage with them and so on and so forth. So it's, from a point of view of practical solutions right now at this moment, we, yes, I, I agree with that. Uh, I think the stride will still see that uh, very much as um, this idea of democracy by stakeholders, uh, stakeholders uh, very anti-democratic uh, very uh, top-down um, event decisions are made by whom? Decisions are made by states, uh, at, even at the UN um, General Assembly, but, but they are nation states. Who is setting the agenda there? Uh, are people setting the agenda? No, not at all. Uh, are these corporations setting the agenda? Of course. Uh, do, uh, to which point do we... To which extent do we let these corporations set the agenda? Of course, they're going to set the agenda. They're on trying to set in their own favor. That's obvious. Uh, we are trying to curb that. Can we curb that by this means? Maybe we can engage with them. Uh, we can, uh, and that's better than not engaging. And that's different engagement from, and that we go back to the idea of uh, supranational law. If it is supranational law, it has to be. It, it, so th this gap between substantive and uh, uh, the goal of 
even the agreements that we uh, are hoping to achieve now through uh, this idea of um, you know, stakeholders participation in the process because of existential risks, we have lowered the bar so much <laughs> But it's, it's like we were, yeah. So like the idea of positive pizza was like impossible, but now we are running after negative peace and the bar is lower and lower. And we have to have a bar and we have to do something, but we have to recognize what we're doing and be honest about it. And at which point and what compromises we're making because of this bar. And so that is my point that there is not so much clarity uh, in the uh, discussion, even at the UN level uh the general assembly and all that as to what's the goal who's going to benefit and how we're going to guarantee that we are going the right direction the fact that we're engaging these corporations who knows maybe it's good maybe it's bad it can go either way and so that that is my uh my 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 big concern with also the ideas of the um you know the sdgs and the other ideas that are now Developing more and more, including you know the long termism, which there are as you know you know some very big ethical considerations to be uh, considered when we think about that, and uh, where these things can take a life of their own, and uh, what is uh, the uh, how do we control these things? That is what I'm saying. So I just yeah, of course, but uh, <laughs> the bar is so low that yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, not seeing any hands from anyone who hasn't yet shared. Let me uh, bring Carla May in. Thank you. I, I would like to just say, Tiana and the rest, I think we are being led exactly where he points. If you watch the news, we are frustrated completely by the fact that we are being pointed at the individual. The individual mi uh, migrants that are being bused to Washington, D.C. Nobody knows what to do because they're crossing borders. The sovereignty that is paid no attention of as they try to move throughout Europe, as they try to leave uh, still uh, Serbia, uh, Syria, and as they, the, the whole migrant question, the question we were not able to deal as nations or corporations with the COVID virus vaccine because individuals needed them. And we had to look past borders and past sovereignty. And we'd made a, we made a, a fiasco of it. We are, we are, in my view, we are right smack where we need to be, where we are being faced with the individual dignity of people that have been tossed aside for the sovereignty of governments. And the more that this is in our face, the more we're going to have to do something about it as a group of nations. Thank you. Tiziana, any comments? No, I, I, I agree. Um, and uh, the, the practical, uh, steps toward this, uh, of course, uh, can be, I, I don't know, I think that some of the um, debate uh, as it is now is, uh, of course, led by uh, the urgency of the problems that we have uh, uh, and uh, focusing again back to what is uh, the end, who is going to benefit from these changes at the end, it should be really a big part of the debate we're having now. As we move toward making some concrete steps, and we do make some concrete steps, uh, you know, in bigger, better cooperation. But for whose benefit? That should always be the question. Uh, what would, yeah. Okay, thank you. We do have time for one more question, especially if there's someone who hasn't asked the question yet. If not, we can move on to the announcements. Okay, hearing none. Do you have something to ask? Oh. I was asking Drea, she had something oh. to ask. Usually she has questions. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> not, not this time, okay. Um, um, good. 
In that it was case, a really, oh. I loved the, I, I loved the slides that you provided. They were such a great overview of everything. Um, so thank you so much for the, um, that was really helpful. Great. So um, before we get to the announcements, I'll just let Tiziana know that we usually, when, when the session is done, have a little debriefing. So if you want to stay with us for five minutes after, uh, we could talk about how it went and what we could do, if anything, to make it even better next time. Um, so, um, but at this time, I'll turn to Gail to verify when our next session is. And then if there are any other announcements or promotions or anything like that, uh, we can take those. So Gail, if you would verify what we're doing next. Yeah, next session will be the second Saturday of October. The, um, the pattern is to hold the sessions on the second Saturday of the month. And it will be at the same time as this time, namely 2.30 to 4 Eastern time. Um, it's different from what we've used for other books. Just wanted to make sure you note it when you um, put it on your calendar. And um, I think we'll be reading chapters six and seven. That would make it um, the number of pages pretty even um, if we focus on those chapters. The page numbers are different in the physical book than um, if you bring it up when you click on the link. So, um, but um, I'll send information about that with the next email. Yeah. So just to verify, we're skipping chapter five. Was that the decision? Oh, no, what? No. Today went up to four. Today was two, three, no, and four. No, chapters five and six. Five what? and six, okay. I thought that's what I said. Oh, anyway, yeah. I heard six and seven. I don't know what you said, um, but I know what I heard. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Okay, so please put it on your calendars. Terrific. So at, at this time, if anybody has any events that they wanted to share about or books they're promoting or anything else, the floor is open for that. 